Hey everyone, I got the chance to interview the author of this book, which is Tetsuro Miyazaki, and the book is called Hafu to Hafu. And what it is, it's questions from one Hafu to another Hafu. That's why it's Hafu to Hafu. And this was uh, Tetsuro's project, and he wanted to interview pretty much every combination of Hafu, uh, like half Japanese, half some other foreign country combination that he could. And all in all, he got 120 different countries in the book. So it's quite fascinating the diversity of people he got to interview as well as the, the diversity of questions he had them ask. Uh, but I'll let him explain all about it because I, I think I'm doing a terrible job. But what I did want to say is that um, I only got him to answer a few of the questions that the other Hafus posed in this book. Uh, I think nine of them. If you, and there's like 120 different questions in here. So if you want to get the whole book, I'll leave the link to the book in the description. Anyways, I'll let him talk because he's way more eloquent than I am. Okay. All right. So, hi. I'm Miyazaki Tetsuro or Tetsuro Miyazaki. I'm half Belgian and half Japanese. I'm photographer, born and raised in Belgium. I had a Japanese father and a Belgian mom and I'm the photographer of a photo project called Hafu to Hafu, which is about mixed race Japanese identity worldwide. So this is the photo book um, that I recently released, um, and it has 120 photos from um, Hafu from almost 100 different countries combined with uh, Japan. Each photo in the, in the project, so I meet people, we have a one hour discussion. It's a, it's a very open talk about who we are, where we come from, what, what issues we face. Um, what we have in common is what we discuss and then what's, what separates us, what makes us different from each other. And at the end of this conversation, we try to distill, if you want, um, one single question that kind of summarizes the whole conversation or the main topic of the conversation. Um, and that's what I put in the book. So each, um, each photo, I don't know if you can see that, but each, each photo has obviously the face in it. Um, then here is a question um, that this person wants to ask me or herself or her parents, her friends, um, and, and you ultimately as a, as a viewer. All right, so this question is, I'll read it to you. Um, how can Japanese changing society benefit from your halfness? Um, wow, um, thanks for picking an easy question. Um, it's, it's really hard to say, but whether we want to or not, being mixed Japanese makes us ambassadors for, um, for diversity in Japan. So depending on the level of um, involvement you have, which can be from very little to very high, you're still representing um, a minority within the Japanese society. And that doesn't mean you always have to act that way, um, but it's the way that you're often seen. So you have the chance to, to educate the people around you who may be less familiar with biracialism or um, having different roots, having um, growing up with different cultures and also you have the chance to change the expectations that people have, the stereotypical expectations that people have of being mixed Japanese. So next question is from uh, Christopher Asahara and his question is if for some reason you have to choose which nationality would it be? Um, in my case, super simple, I chose Belgian because um, I was born and raised in Belgium. I plan to live in Belgium or in Europe, I live in the Netherlands now, but, um, and I was told I had to choose. So I chose and it would have made no sense to be, to have a Japanese passport and living and trying to work and raise a family in Belgium because ultimately I would probably have tried to get an EU citizenship. Um, so for me, this is a, this is a no-brainer. But depending on where you live, or um, 
it could also be determined by the strength of a passport. Um, if you have a passport that gets you into no countries at all without a visa, then you might as well want to choose a Japanese passport. So for some people, it's, it's very opportunistic. Sometimes it can be out of loyalty um, or it's, it's just where you live. I think some other people, it's just identity too. Like they feel like what's on the passport is who they are. So if they, they lose their Japanese passport, they lose like being Japanese. Some people told me. Yeah. Yeah, I think I think so too. I think um, what what's what your passport says said a lot about who you are. And another question here is what is Japanese? And my very 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 simple um, answer to that very difficult question is what does your passport say? And that's it. That's all there is to it. If you can participate in the Olympics under the Japanese flag, representing it, you're Japanese. I mean, I I wouldn't participate or I wouldn't be chosen to be in any <laughs> sports in the Olympics, but, you know, assuming that you're super good at something, um, I think you could narrow it down to that, to, to nationality. But it's binary. In my opinion, it's binary. You cannot be more or less or a little Japanese or once, you know, it's, it's you're Japanese or you're not. But I mean, for example, there are people who before 1985, they can, they're technically allowed to have dual citizenship. Right. So they can be Japanese hmm. and American or Belgian yeah. or whatnot. Yeah, so it, it can be an and. I didn't say it could not be an and. It's you're Japanese or not. It doesn't mean you're Japanese or something else. It's Japanese or not Japanese. And then could be American and Japanese, technically. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. This question is... Um, in what moment did you first realize you were different? And for me, this goes back to 1986, when Belgium was playing in the World Cup football, and Belgium was doing super good. They were, they were doing really well. They got to the semifinals, then lost against Argentina, and you don't have to be a football fanatic to probably know who Diego Maradona was, or, or is. Um, and they were doing really well. And like every kid, I was playing and I wanted to be Belgium. And I was cheering for Belgium. But some kids told me I couldn't. They said, no, you can't be Belgium, you have to be Japan. Which was, which not, was not very cool in, in 1986. Japan was not even participating in um, the World Cup. They didn't have any football um, in Japan at that time, not at a, at a serious level. Um, so that wasn't, that wasn't too cool. And, what I learned then is that people constantly ask me who you cheer for, which is a very simple and, and non, um, uh, how do you say, non-attacking, or it's not a difficult question to ask where, who are you for. But I realized that there is no correct answer because whatever answer I would give, if I'd say Belgium, then there's a follow-up question and I have to justify why Belgium and I have to explain why not Japan. Same if I say Japan, because I think obviously Belgium is wrong, right? So I'll, next time I'll say Japan, I'll say Japan, and then the next person asks why Japan and why not Belgium? So whatever the, the answer I would give to a question like that, and there are plenty of questions like that, do you prefer Belgian food or Japanese food, or would you rather live here or there? So there are so many of these questions that are very simple that people ask, without knowing the implication of the question and what that does to me, what that did to me as a kid, which means I have to think about the answer and I have to juggle or balance between how I feel and what I think the person in front of me wants to hear. Because in Japan, the answer might be different than in Belgium. Um, so. It, it made me very, very um, insecure, maybe, or just just um, creative as well about the answer that I'd give to that question. It feels like um, like like a bingo, bingo, <laughs> bingo machine. That we could do that too, like right, right, with questions. Yeah. Next question. Ninety-three. This question. 
is would you feel more relaxed in a third country that does not make part of your identity? So in my case, this would mean not Belgium and not Japan. Um, like I said, I was born in, in, in Belgium and that, that was fine for me. So I didn't feel the need to leave that place. But I do know that it sometimes creates an inequality between the parents because one of the parents goes to the other person's country and then has to adjust to that country. So I get why some people would prefer to live in a neutral place where both parents have to adopt, where both parents are equally foreign um, uh, or alien, and then they would be able to grow up not torn between the two, between the two parents. Um, and a, quite a few people from this project are born and raised in this third country. Um, but I, 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 I wouldn't be able to say if more of these people turned out fine and without identity issues than others. So that's, that's really hard to say. What about people being born in Japan versus the other country? Do you think they did better off if people were born in Japan or the other country or some mixed bag? Yeah, so some of the people I interviewed were born and raised in Japan. Some of the people I interviewed were born and raised in the other country, so the other parent's um, country of origin. And then a third country is the, is the third option. And I've been asked if it was easier to be grown, to grow up in Japan um, or the other country, what makes it more easy. Um, but again, there's, there's no single, single truth to, to, that, um, to the answer that I give. For some people, it works out just fine to be born and raised here. Um, but it, it also depends on the access you have to the other country whether or not your other country's representative parent is, is present, if he's or she is, is, in, um, is in your life or not. Um, it depends on, um, on your surroundings, who do you have around you. Um, so there are many, many more factors than just that one that define how people um, experience uh, growing up there. Question, have you ever met a Hafu with the same roots, but who grew up in the other country? So in that case, or in my case, you want to know if I met a Japanese Belgian who grew up in Japan. And the answer is um, yes, I've met some, but that's because, because of the project. I've met so many people. And what's, what's funny, is that they identify as Japanese stronger than I do and they often um, identify as Japanese more than they identify as Belgian. So I would say I'm Belgian and I'm, I'm part Japanese and they would do it the other way around and they would say I'm Japanese with a touch of Belgianness. So this is a question by Keiko. Um, what would you tell your lo your younger self? Um, I would I would tell myself that um, it it doesn't matter how hard you try to fit in somewhere, um, or to try less that it's okay to try less to fit in to Japan, because in my case, I was born and raised in Belgium, and <coughs> I wanted to be seen as more Japanese, <coughs> both in Belgium, um, by acting Japanese in some way, um, as I would have in Japan, so learning Japanese, going to Japanese school, um, somehow dressing more Japanesey. Um, but still, not being seen as Japanese um, is something that frustrated me for quite
quite a while. They, no matter how well I would speak Japanese, it would never be enough. And that's, that's something that I'm very demanding for myself, and I think that the rest of the world is too, but it comes from both sides. It's hard to determine who's putting pressure on me. Um, and I would tell myself to put less pressure on myself and to say, stop caring that much. But what I've learned throughout this project is that self-acceptance is something that everybody tells you, you know, to have, accept who you are, and it's probably the hardest thing to do. Yeah, I think, I mean, it's, it's hard to tell a young kid that, because... And it's fine to be different. Yeah, right. Tell that to the rest of my class who's not different. Um, so, yeah, I think caring less and, and, yeah, and, and maybe that being different is okay, but that's something that people tell you all the time, but you just need to experience it. You need to go through some of the pains before you actually understand that, that there is some truth in that. So, what is your first impression of the word Hafur? I think I used this word for the first time when I was a kid going to Japan in summer and when people asked me, who are you, where are you from? Um, I went to the countryside in Japan, in Kyushu, in Sagaken, some people had never seen a non-Japanese person before, before me. So they, they would ask me and I would explain that I'm Hafu, Belgian Hafu. Um, so it was, it was a very, very f okay word to use. Um, then I started to realize that it meant half something. And at some point um, I said, I'm half Belgian and half Japanese. So. The ha this half has Japanese blood and that half has Belgian blood. Um, so that's, that's kind of how I felt, that it was both half made a whole. And then um, some, someone told me when I was in my teens, they said, yeah, you can't use the word half, but you have to use the word double, which is double, because you're more than one, you're, the, you're, you're two. And I used that for a while, again, in Japan, but then I'd have to explain what that meant. And explaining what that meant would often result in, ah, half of this car. I'm like, yeah, yeah, okay, that. So I kind of gave up because it was, you know, it, it was hard to keep up explaining this all the time. So um, kind of gave up and um, I still use the word, I still use the word hafu. Um, and I, I think it's an okay, it's an okay label. Um, some people don't like it. Some people prefer others, other words like biracial or multiracial, or some people prefer double. Um, but I'm, I'm, I'm very okay with hafu. And I think some of the resentment comes from, well, first the word half. It's often parents that don't want me or anybody else to call their kid half something because that's so negative. Um, but it's, it's just a label. Like, like there are so many labels that can be misused, right? Like woman, for example. If you tell someone she's just a woman and therefore cannot do this and that, then, then it's a bad label. Same with hafu. You're hafu so you cannot join this or that activity. Then it becomes very negative. But it's not the word in itself that's so negative. It's the whole, it's the whole world around it that's, uh, that's messed up. So just, just focusing on this word isn't, isn't going to change, um, change the world or change the perception of it. Um, so all in all, I'm, I'm, I'm okay with it. Yeah. So this question is, what is in your lunchbox? Um, I grew up in Belgium and most of the kids in Belgium have, um, have warm lunch at school. So it's a prepared lunch. Um, but if I would take lunch, it would mostly have been um, sandwiches with some spread or some, uh, some meat in between. Um, that was my, my lunchbox. And then every now and then, um, either my Japanese father or my mom, Belgian mom, would make a bento. But I guess 
for my Belgian friends, it looks it would have looked exotic. But I think I would have been ashamed to show it to any Japanese person because you know a Belgian mom who has no who doesn't live in Japan doesn't have much reference for how to make a bento. Uh, so I remember having, and I was my dad too, um, making these these huge onigiris. They were about, I mean, it was a, a, a decent meal in one onigiri. There was half a fish in it. Um, so that was, that was that was what we had. And I went to Japanese school, and you know, we were. I don't know if we were really ashamed to to get the onigiri out, but it was it wasn't what the other kids uh, kids had. Um, uh, so yeah, that's that's what was in my lunchbox. This question is super simple. <laughs> what is being Japanese? And it's it's one of the key questions, I guess, in in this project. And when we talk about half or mixed Japanese identity, we often talk about what's what's Japanese. And sometimes we say, sometimes it's easier. To look at what what's not Japanese, because people in Japan look at me and say, "Well, you're clearly not Japanese," but it's easy to determine what's not Japanese. But it's harder to determine what's really what is Japanese. So what's left? And the more I talk about this, and the more I think about this question, the simpler my answer gets, and that is. It's what's on your passport. The passport determines whether or not something or someone, of, often someone, I guess, on a passport. Um, your passport says Japanese, and that means you're Japanese. And it could be as simple as that. Do you have a Japanese passport? Then you're Japanese. You can compete in the Olympics for Japan. You can play tennis for Japan. Then you're Japanese. So that's all the questions I got him to answer. Um, again, a lot more in this book. I thought it was so fascinating because even if you're not hafu or if you're in the parent of a hafu, just looking at all the questions posed, it brings up a lot of discussions and a lot of really interesting questions. Um, and the reason I was interviewing him, I shouldn't forget this, was that I am making a documentary which is tentatively called Being Japanese and it's answering or trying to answer the question of what it is to be Japanese, what makes someone Japanese. And I am interviewing all different sorts of Japanese people. And uh, if you're interested in that, I'll leave a link in the description to that project as well. And I'll leave it at that. So as always, thanks for watching and I'll catch you on the flip side. Cheers.